Coming up this week on the show, we have Peter Ski Sports, sound designer and musician, and responsible for some amazing sounds of various synths that you will definitely know over the years. He was one of the first people to program the Korg M1 and was involved in the design process of the M1. You may know Ski Jam from the Wave Station, that, that was him. But he's worked on Oasis, he's worked on uh, Prophecy, he's worked on the new synths like the Wave State, the Mod Wave, the uh, 2600, the Korg 2600 plugin, and the new Multipoly. So we're going to be talking about a career in sound design, and he's got some great stories about uh, programming the M1, Wave Station, and other synths. So he's a really great chap to talk to, so I think you're going to really enjoy this. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And I'm really excited to get you on the show today because you worked on the sound design of some of my all-time favorite synthesizers and some of my all-time favorite sounds of those synthesizers as well. So I'm really glad you could join us today. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm glad, glad to be here. And um, just in case anybody doesn't, rec doesn't recognize your name, Peter Swartz, but you might recognize the ski part because that's sort of your, the name that you go by. Um, but particularly, they'll recognize it from certain synths, especially if you go in the mod wave or the wave state, you can see your name in there. But also, to me, it, as soon as I heard your name, I think of Ski Jam from the wave, uh, wave station. Yeah, guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> so before I talk about that, we'll come to the wave station. So where does the ski bit come from? So, uh, all right. I, I've, I've been training on how to make a long story short. So when... <laughs> When I was, you know, in, in my late teens, early 20s, had to make a living. And I, I, I found a way to uh, make some money playing with a polka band. And so it was, you know, Dave Duchnowski and Jim Dombrowski and, you know, everybody else had a ski at the end of their surname, except, you know, right. I was Schwartz. So they started calling me Schwartzki. And then um, they wanted some original polkas. So I... <laughs> I wrote a couple of polkas and we went into a recording studio and the uh, recording engineer um, just started calling me Ski because he said Schwartzki was too hard to say. And then later on, I went to work in a music store and there was another guy uh, named Peter working there. And it got really confusing when they call over the PA, you know, Peter line one. So I said, all right, just just call me Ski. He'll he'll be Peter. And so pe customers in the store got used to calling me Ski. And I actually prefer it to my real name. So Ski stuck. So yeah, you'll see Ski Jam and you'll see in the in the credits of the uh the more recent synths, like you know, the the wave state and the mod wave and uh the multi poly, it'll say Peter Ski Schwartz or just Ski. Yeah. So yeah. That's that. Uh, that's that's the short version. <laughs> I, I love that, and and just you know, I play what was it, nineteen ninety, and playing on you know in a music store, playing on the wave station, and Ski Jam was the, the first thing that when you switch the wave station on, isn't it? So uh, yeah, that's that's really. And I never knew where it came from, so it's great that I know that now. From oh. from polkas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about the synths that you've worked on, and you've worked on really. Um, like I mentioned, the wave station, and but you've also mentioned some of the other ones. We'll talk about the recent ones. But before we, we, we go on to that, so how did give us a bit of background on you uh, and before you got into the sound design element? Um, I was a classical pianist from the time I was, you know, I started taking piano lessons at like five years old, and it was all classical. And I ended up going to a conservatory after high school, Manhattan School of Music, classical, 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 but. Um, my cousin turned me on to Pink Floyd and uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and a lot of the progressive bands. And I developed this fascination with, you know, these keyboard things that had all these knobs on them. And uh, I, I ended up buying my, my first synth was a multi Moog. So it was the two oscillator version of the micro Moog and got into synthesis and um that and, and in in school we had an ARP 2500. There was an electronic music lab, so it's a, a conservatory, but there were elective classes. I chose electronic music, so they had some really weird stuff, and they had this ARP 2500. So I cut my teeth on that, and um, then I ended up working in this music store and had access to 
you know, every every synthesizer that was current at the time. Um, and I was uh, when the DX7 came out. Uh, so that was like 86, I think. Um, yeah, 85, 86. I don't remember. But around that time. So I the the DX7 had this reputation of being this great sounding synthesizer, but it worked on a completely different paradigm from, you know, the analog synthesis model, which was really almost the only thing uh, available at the time. So, you know, the analog synthesis or subtractive synthesis architecture is you start with a sound source that's as bright as that sound source will ever be. That's your oscillator. And then you modify the harmonic content by running that signal into a filter. And then the filter goes into an amplifier, which is a volume control that's always closed until you hit a key to generate a control voltage to open the volume. And then when you release the key, the volume closes. So it's the oscillator filter amplifier model that is the basis of pretty much most of the synthesizers on the market, even even today. But the DX7 was this frequency modulation thing and no one understood how to program it. So I thought, all right, let me try and make a niche for myself by getting a DX7. And I, I was lucky enough to get one of the first ones that came into the music stores in New York City. And I learned how to program it. And I was also into um, uh, machine language programming at the time one of my you know hobbies and i ended up writing an editor for the dx7 and i could watch parameter changes on this little commodore 64 screen like in real time so i learned a lot about the synthesis techniques and how to get certain sounds and so you know the music store um exposure to all these uh analog synthesizers the dx7 um you know self-imposed dx7 indoctrination and uh just a, a general love of the electronic alternative to the cl classical world that I grew up in um, is what served as my background. And then one day, Jack Kotop, who's a, a well-known programmer um, from Korg, he came into the music store and we became friends. And uh, one day he asked me to go over to Korg, uh, which was like, I don't know, like a 40, 50 mile drive uh, out, out on Long Island. And he didn't exactly tell me why I was going there, but he wanted me to go there. So I did. And they put this keyboard in front of me called a DS8, which was a, a scaled down version of a DX7. It was frequency modulation, but it only had four oscillators. And I played with it for a while. And then they said, OK. Um, and, and I guess I was there because I had developed this reputation as a DX7 programmer. And they said, OK, sell this to us. And I'm like, <laughs> All right. I mean, I didn't think I was going there for a salesman's job, but I, I talked it up and, you know, they, they liked what I had to say about it. And from there, they gave me a, a gig making a bank of factory sounds for the DS8. And um, not all that long after that, they invited me to go to Korg in Japan, which is, you know, uh, so the Korg, Korg out on Long Island is Korg USA. They're the distributor of Korg products. And now they distribute all kinds of other stuff like, you know, amps and guitars. But at the time they were doing um, synthesizers and keyboards. And they invited me to go to Japan to consult on the design of some new synth. I had no idea what it was. So um, I met Korg for the first time, uh, barely spoke any Japanese. I, mean, I tried to learn a little bit, but, you know, at least most most of the guys there, you know, could could speak English well enough to explain to me why I was there. And they brought me into this little room and they presented me with, um, it was a piece of plywood with a circuit board mounted on it. And just like the little, the little like rectangular LED, uh, LCD display from the M1, you know, it's so raw components like screwed to this <laughs> piece of plywood and a keyboard, you know, just this hanging out keyboard with a ribbon cable that connected to the circuit board, and that was the M1. That was going to become the M1. And well, they, they wanted me to, um, you know, play with it and, and comment on the, the synth architecture, meaning, for example, how the envelope generator for the filter was routed to the filter to control it. They, they wanted my feedback on, on the architecture, on the design of it. And 
excuse me one sec. So one of the first things that I asked them to change was was this. So they had um, the envelope generator for the filter was sending signal directly to the filter. And there was an amount control, which, you know, of course, you, you have to have an amount control. Yeah. So it was envelope generator into an, an attenuator, as it's called, a digital attenuator, because it was a completely digital uh, device, and then to the filter. So that's basically a direct connection. And to be able uh, to play with velocity sensitivity so that you could play soft and get a dull sound and play harder and get a brighter sound, they had a separate uh, control for routing the velocity value to the filter. So velocity could be used to raise the cutoff frequency at the same time the envelope generator, en <laughs> envelope generator was also raising the frequency. And I thought, you know, and it didn't work very well for me. Uh, the idea of having to dial in the amount of envelope opening and closing of the filter and then have velocity as this separate thing that actually would offset the the uh, the envelope generator control voltage. It's all digital, but I always think in analog terms. Yeah. So I asked them if they could do the following, if they could take the envelope gener generator, route it into that attenuator, but make the attenuator controllable by velocity. So in, in this way, you could turn up the envelope generator amount to control cutoff to, to the maximum you ever wanted it to be. So when you hit, you know, with full force on the keyboard, the sound is going to be as bright as it is ever going to get. And then have a separate velocity control that takes that down proportionally. And they were like, okay. And they came back the next day. They burned a new EEPROM, um, which is a, a chip. We put the chip in the circuit board. And bingo, I got what I wanted. It, was, it, it went from being sort of a little uncontrollable in terms of how velocity controlled the filter to being very musical uh, in, in, in my estimation. And they liked it and they kept it. And there were many other changes like that, um, which I suggested. And um, one of my favorite stories, it's like really a techno geeky story, but I, I, I still love to tell it. So Jack Hotop and I are, are there and we're playing with the, uh, the joystick. Um, we, were, we were playing, you know, we're playing with the instrument and noting that um, when you push, and I'll just refer to it as the mod wheel because it, yeah. um, it's equivalent. So when we push the mod wheel just a tiny amount past center point, it was just too much vibrato. And then the further we pushed it, of course, it was even more vibrato. And it wasn't even so much dependent on how the sounds were programmed in terms of like maximum vibrato depth because you could set that. But it, it was just too sensitive with very small movements. So we asked why that was, and the engineers showed us that they programmed the response curve. It was basically uh, linear. So, you know, it, but it didn't, even though the curve in software or in theory was a linear curve, in practice, that first increment going from zero to one produced too much vibrato intensity and you couldn't get any subtlety out of the vibrato. Um, so what we did with him, uh, with the engineer was we hand selected the values for every step in the curve up to a certain <sighs> point. So if the, if the value in the, in that first increment was one, in their, you know, in their way of doing things in their linear curve, we were like, okay, let's, let's try 0.4. And then the next one should be 0.6 and then 0.8 and then point and then one and then 1.2. And so we gave him these values to, to plug in and he had to, he had to type them in manually, compile it, 
we tried it out. No, that that it's it's still too deep when we move the, the mod wheel just a tiny bit. So let's change it from 0.2 to 0.1. And we got that granular with it. And I've, uh, I remember the, the engineer getting a little bit tense because I don't think they were used to um, having a musician come in and say these mathematical values, which, you know, in, in technical terms should produce a musical result, aren't very musical. But we spent a lot of time on that. And so the response, the vibrato response on the M1 is literally the result of myself and Jack dictating to an engineer, okay, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.9, you know, and until we got this curve that looked really messy on the screen, but performed really musically. Yeah. And uh, uh, we also did a lot of sample editing. This was like one of the first, if not the first uh, keyboard that had ROM based samples. I could be wrong about that, but I think I'm well, almost yeah, kind of right. Yeah, especially mainstream one, yeah. So, one, and, and there wasn't a lot of memory in the machine. Um, memory at the time was very expensive. So memory conservation was a big deal. So one of the things that I was tasked with at the time was to look at the string samples and see just how much I could slice off the attack, like eat into the, move, move the sample pointer into the attack point of the, nat, you know, the natural bow that was recorded from the string section to save, you know, to still have it sound natural, but, um, say, you know, save that many bytes, as many bytes as possible, and then play the sample and find loop points. So, so the samples would loop that would sound as good as possible, but not have these really long loops, have shorter loops. So we, and we did all this by ear, and we had special software that we worked on to set the start and end points and the loop points. And we'd sit there and play the same note over and over and, and listen to the loop. And, you know, for all these different multi samples, uh, it was all manual, sort of like manual work, not, no, no automation whatsoever. And um, that, that was the process that was about two weeks of sample editing and, you know, value tweaking and making suggestions about um, how the synth architecture worked. And that went on to being, you know, the the largest selling keyboard of all time, from piece of plywood to that. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing instrument because we had like the D fifty before, which had the very short attack samples, and then right. synthesis. But the M one is the first. They now call them romplers, wouldn't they? But it, you know, it's the first of that sort of machine. Rompler, with, that's yeah. Yeah, producing real sounds as opposed to like fm or analog or whatever and of course then it was packaged up so well wasn't it with the effects and the drums and everything it's the first workstation i suppose as well the first yeah it had oh, it had a very coarse resolution um sequencer in it and um it also had the uh what was it the the the, the 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 cards the card slots yes. for additional samples and that was the least expensive way to uh expand the the memory because it wasn't ram it was a rom card um yeah so so some of the the presets on the and the m1 were they the ones that you worked on some of them i i didn't make all that many for the m1 at the end of the day um i ended up making more factory patches when they did the m1 expansion but my work on that was was mostly oh we also did some sampling sessions so some of the samples right. And Jack remembers those details way better than I do. But um, so my work was mainly uh, synth des synth design, uh, sample editing, sample making, and some factory, you know, some of the factory sounds. And, and then the, the legacy of that M1 is, is sort of continues, you know, passed on down all through the different versions of the uh, core flagship synths. And I mean, essentially the, the, they took that architecture and it carried on for years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the formula was, it, it became self-evident. Uh, I, you know, when, when you have samples baked into the machine, uh, you're, you're going to get more realistic sounds. Um, 
you're not going to have to compromise like with the D50 to try and get something that had a natural attack. You know, here the the sounds have built in natural attack as natural as they were at the time. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of a, of a, of a rompler and later, you know, when, when, uh, you could like with, with the Oasis, with, uh, with r actual Ram where you could load sounds into Ram from a disc. I mean, that was just, a you know, a, uh, a home run, a home run in terms of uh, uh, synth design, and and produced a more realistic result than than was possible before. Yeah. And so after the M1, you said you worked on the the, the, the EX. I think you did. You work on the T series as well. Yeah. In in my mind, the so the M1 was like the the flagship at the time, and then there was the M uh, the M1 rack, and then the M3 rack. And then the T1, T2, and T3, which were um, all basically the same synth, but they had, uh, I think the, the, the T1, T2, and T3 were differentiated just by the size of the keyboard. Yeah. Uh, and I think the the sample content, I think we, we did additional samples for that, which eventually were available for the M1 expansion. But yeah... Uh, the the M1 started it all, and then they made all these derivative products. Yeah, I remember watching uh, Tangerine Dream live. I think it was about ninety, well, early nineties, and they had a T1, and it always looked mm. such an impressive one because it's got the big keyboard on it as well. Yeah, yeah, and then so I, th I think one of the not that much long after that, did you then start to work on the waves, uh, the wave station? Because that's a different that, thing, isn't it? That came from a different angle. Yeah, and it came from a different part of Korg that was being developed by Korg R and D, which is in California. Um, and that was <laughs> that was another one where they said, oh, "Yeah, come out to California. We want you to check out this new synth we're working on." And when when I went into that meeting, um, I I had no idea that they were doing anything with this this new concept called wave sequencing. But when I walked into the meeting, all the engineers were talking about physical modeling at the time. And that subject was way over my head. So I walked into this meeting and they're talking about, you know, uh, resonance and they're talking about uh, excitation. And I really felt like, why why am i here i i this is like advanced physics and i'm just a lowly like sound designer and then they went into the wave station um so and by that time i was already feeling defeated because i couldn't keep up with these guys and they explained the wave sequencing thing to me and that seemed to make more sense okay you have one sound and then over time that sound can fade out while another sound fades in and then that one can fade out while another sound fades in so i'm thinking in my mind okay this is cool i could make like these moving textures start with strings and then cross fade into some other thing and you know so that appealed to me um and the other the alternative to that was to have sounds just switch so you 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 play one sound and it lasts for a certain duration and then it suddenly changes to another sound and then that lasts for a certain duration and that suddenly changes to another sound. And that concept I was familiar with as a, as a PPG programmer, because that's wave table. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, wave table was uh, on the PPG was, was dealing with single cycle waveforms. So you're talking about sustaining, you know, some static tone and you could get these very granular sounding <laughs> things out of, the wave sweeping through a wave table because every wave is just you know a single cycle and sounds completely different from the next one in in some cases uh so you get the you can get these tumbling weird sounds or if the wave table was basically a representation of triangle to saw then as you sweep through the wave table you're going from a dull sound to a bright sound almost sounds like filtering um, but here's the, here with the wave station, it was the idea, okay, you've got these samples that are long and you can, so it's like, it's beyond wave table. It's literally wave sequencing of samples. Um, 
so that appealed to me. But by by the by the end of that day, I was still feeling like, you know, a little jet lagged and like, uh, you know, what, what do I have to contribute to this? This is such a, a new concept. Um, you know, I guess all I can do is make factory sounds. And it turned out, OK, that's that's why they wanted me there to see what sort of inspiration I could get from that. Um, so I went back to my hotel room with uh, with a prototype. And I was still feeling like, you know, like a fish out of water and Jack was there. I was like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what I'm I mean, I like the concept, but, you know, they were talking about all this advanced stuff and I maybe I'm not up to it. And he's like, dude, let's smoke a J. So, you know, and and Jack had the best stuff. So smoked a joint. And then I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm I, I'll work on this for a while. And from that. I came up with Ski Jam. So that was me <laughs> chilling out, letting all the intimidation wash away from me. And I'm like, okay, let's let's do something that's cool and rhythmic. And, you know, I, I know that the sound has become iconic. Um, and some people love it and some people hate it. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. But... My first instinct was, you know, not not to make not to make something that was. I just wanted to make something cool and rhythmic, and so Ski Jam came out of that. And then the second patch I remember making um, the following day was called uh, "Will I Dream." Oh yes. And "Will I Dream" has this. It's completely the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, I think it's you have to push the mod wheel up to get the effect, but it's got this harmonic sweep that it it goes up up do, 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 but not in the traditional way that you'd hear from a filter and it slowly settles down through all these sort of enharmonic overtones and that was a result of picking samples and tuning them to certain frequencies that I just you know not the harmonic series exactly but something that was reminiscent of it and um, so those are the, the two sounds I remember. I remember making on the wave station. Ski jam was just this, just yeah. I mean, I think I go back to 1990, where it was in a music store. I'd played a D50, played an M1. Um, I had a D20, I think it would have been at that time. So yeah, so I had you know the nice synths. But then you went mm. you went into the music shop and you press one note with your left hand, and then you you know you suddenly got this sequence that came alive um yeah i remember being completely blown away by that and i can see why Korg chose that as preset zero and you know the, the one that comes on power up because it it does it, it's not, not like anything else you you know you heard at the time maybe yeah you're right about the, the ppg but i didn't connect that at the time it was just wow this is something totally new and then that right hand sound the mini lead sound i think is still one of my favorite sounds it's something i Aww. still use in tracks now um and, and I think I mentioned when it, when we chatted before, uh, one of my favourite groups is Genesis. Tony Banks uh, recording "We Can't Dance." He just got the wave uh, wave station and uh, fading lights. The last track on the album has got the beautiful pad sound, which I think is called "Warm Strings." Mm. Um, but then in the solo, there's the the right hand of Ski Jam, so it's the, the mini lead sound, which is I think it's actually called mini lead later in the patch bank but it's where the, it's been split out just, okay and it was always one of my favorite tracks and um i think he modified it as well to make it it's monophonic in the in the main solo and then towards the end of the solo it goes into poly mode and i okay. think he just edited it and saved it but yeah. it, it, it was just a thing of my uh, yeah so, so it, it's got a real special place in my heart that sound and still oh, you know, on the cool. last tour that when i went to watch genesis in when was it 2020 Two was it? I think when they did their final tour, mm. they played a bit of Fading Lights, and you know, so you still hear a bit of that sound. But yeah, it's still one of my favorite sounds, and I recreated that on the Mod Wave. Oh, cool! Um, and I've included it in my patch banks. I, I actually recreated it on the Wave State, which is really easy to do because oh. your sequence oh. is in there. <laughs> yeah, so that so that was that was easy to do. on the Mod Wave. It's not so easy because you've got uh two oscillators well four if you you know you choose the two layers whereas mm. I, when i looked 
I use the uh, Wave State native, oh, the the Wave Station plugin, the Korg one. Okay. And I could see the you, it, you can view the the uh, right. Wave Station on there, so I could see how I thought there's no way I could do that with four oscillators, but you know you can actually do it on the on the mod wave by just a bit of clever timing of the four things so you can create that sound yeah um and i, and I put that up as a download loads of people have downloaded that now and i think because oh, i did cool. label it as the genesis you know we can't dance uh, fading light sounds but and it yeah. was you who reminded me that there was even a right hand sound to that because for for years i had people say, you know talk to me about ski jam did did you make that sound yeah and i to me, ski jam is like the 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 left hand part of the sound, and but it it wasn't the kind of sound. The reason there is a lead there is a split keyboard is because that sound, you know, simply didn't translate across even a five octave keyboard. Like you you're not gonna you're not gonna play this key jam sequence like you know two octaves above middle C. It just it sounds ridiculous. So I I I added a, a split to uh just to, just to fill it out um but S ski jam and and i didn't do ski jam um for the uh for for the wave state that was dan dan phillips uh recreated that and here the funny thing about ski jam is that it got used so much that i re i really wasn't quite sure what to make of it like i almost i almost uh there was a point where i felt a little embarrassed about it because it was used so much um and then there was a, a guy on a discussion forum like if you tell give everybody some advice if you ever want to get your feelings hurt <laughs> go to a discussion forum and talk about something that's near and dear to you okay so this this guy posted you know said you know i want to talk about ski jam or something and i was i was even a moderator on the forum and i'm like well and my name was ski so i said well you know you're talking to the right guy and uh because i made that sound i blah 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 and he said yeah that's probably the 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 worst sound ever programmed in all of synth history and i'm like okay why and he responded because you heard it everywhere <laughs> and i you know i'm some people some people may wear that as a badge of honor i'm it kind of made me a little self-conscious about it and wasn't really quite sure what to make of it so yeah he, he hurt my feelings i'm a little bit of a softy mm. but over time like enough people have told me how much they appreciate that sound and they still love to hear it and so i've you know, I'm I'm over it. I'm over it now. Yeah, but maybe maybe the guy that did the um, the the electric piano for the D, DX7 preset, the, the <laughs> e piano one, maybe he feels the same way because it kind of <laughs> it becomes ubiquitous, isn't it, for a while? Yeah, and and I mean there there's so many there's so many sounds that have become you know, it's an easy word to use, iconic because everybody uses it these days. But you know, it's an easy way to describe. You know, digital native dance from the D D fifty yeah. was used in all sorts of all sorts of ways, and the shakahachi sound from the emulator. You know, that was it's like people couldn't get enough of using that. And uh, Peter Gabriel gave us the the best interpretation of how to play that sound. But yeah, it's I've always been a behind the scenes guy, and so it made me feel a little weird, and that may come across as weird to some of you but that's that's just how i'm wired no, i think credit credit <laughs> i mean yeah I, I i remember i had i was the person you know in, in, going in the store like i said before and i'm just switching the keyboard on and you know putting the head or whatever in the store and playing it and coming across that sound and it was just like nothing else so a bit like digital native dance as well it had the same kind of effect it was just something you know you, you hadn't heard on another synth um so mm. yeah and I, but i think the wave station um still holds up for me because of the rich pad sounds um yes. and and the textures that you get with it so um and i think that's credit to the that wave sequencing and the programming that was done by you and all the other guys that just really made that such a 
a warm, rich sounding synth. I mentioned the Genesis pad, and you hear it all over. I can I can hear it straight away now. You know when you when mm. you, those warm pad sounds, and I still use them now because they're still. They've got an, an era with them, that sort of early 90s thing, but I, I like that. It's just, it's, but it, you know, if, if you go on a nice warm pad sound, then the wave station is, is a go to, uh, you know, synth. And now that's translated across the wave state that, you know, yeah. that is there as well. But yeah, so I think, I think that at a time when synths were getting more boring in the 90s, you know, they got to the, you know, after the M1, they, they became, very much you know just improving the sound quality of the samples and everything else the wave state oh, yeah. is something or the wave station to say was something a little bit different and a proper synthesis engine yeah yeah uh it was it was a a, a brilliant a, a brilliant concept and i i used uh the the wave station for for warm pads on like all kinds of recording sessions it it was either that or the the uh, the JV twenty eighty gave me like the the warm the the warmth sound that you need to just fill out the track. Yeah, um, the the clients that I was doing sessions for, uh, they weren't the kind of clients who who wanted the wave sequencing sound. But I my my wave sequence uh, my wave station got a lot of use as a as a pad machine and a string machine. So yeah. So after after that, what uh, before we get up to the modern synths, what other one core synths did you work on sort of in that period or later? Uh, let's see. I worked on the O1W, and that was another weird trip to Japan. I didn't know why I was going. It turns out that the filter in the O1W didn't have resonance. Um, so you you know you couldn't get any kind of meow. Ever, unless the samples were uh, were samples of synths going now. So they wanted, uh, and they realized that was a shortcoming of the of the, the chip. But they still wanted to try and get a resonant sound out of it. But they had they had instead of a, a resonance, they had a uh, what do they call it? A wave uh, a wave shaper. So I think it was the first time that a wave shaper, DSP wave shaper, was in a synth. And they wanted me to design the wave shapes and hopefully come up with one that when you ran a waveform through it would result in you know, resonant kind of sound. And I managed to come up... Now, th this, this is completely outside of my realm but they gave me some software and they said yeah you can type in like uh trigonometry style codes and i knew a little trigonometry to generate like all these different squiggles on the screen and then i could play sounds through them in real time and see if they provided this resonant quality and i, I stumbled upon a couple that did and those wave shapes are still in use to this day if you if if there's a Korg synthesizer that has the wave shaper in it, and uh, a lot of synths do, and you scroll through the different wave wave shapes, you know, for for getting the different effects, a lot of those are for uh, from what I made for the O1W. So I went to Japan to design nonlinear distortion tables, which is <laughs> which is the technical term for that job. Uh, after that was the prophecy. Um, I, I have nice one there. Uh, th this was this was also new territory because it was physical modeling, and so you have this synthesis where you have to uh, excite a virtual string or you know do something to a excite a virtual pipe and use that to generate sound. And then after that sound is generated. Uh, true to the analog synthesis architecture, you could run that sound through a filter. I think there, there might might be two filters. So the sound generation, instead of having uh, an oscillator, you have this physical model. There are also regular oscillators in there, but you have physical model and the the idea of exciting a, a physical device, uh, of like you know, you know, that's excitation. I've got a piece of glass in this shape, and I'm striking it or you know if, if i was to 
do the wine glass mm-hmm. thing, you know, exciting it, whole different kind of synthesis. Um, so we, uh, we made sounds for that. Uh, we also consulted on the design of, I don't know. Oh yeah. 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 Actually, it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, yeah. troll of that. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, we had a lot of fun working on this, this thing here, which, you know, moves in both directions. Right. We ended up, our, our, our pet name for this was the mod log. So you have the mod wheel and you have the mod log and it would output um, one MIDI CC in this direction, another one in this direction, plus you have the ribbon. So mm-hmm. we, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make this thing, which was a very novel way of adjusting sound, um, to, to do interesting things aside from just having, you know, doing what you do with a mod wheel. Uh, and another challenge was that it was monophonic. So, um, despite despite the monophonic nature of it, a, a lot of iconic sounds were made on this thing too. Yeah, uh, and that, that's that's that been fun. modeled as well, and that's in the core collection. That's in the core collection. Yeah. Yeah, I played on that one. Yeah, it's. It, the, I always think I remember when physical modeling came out, and it it was the next big thing after right. the next sample, but. It, I always feel it never really took off, though. Perhaps it's because it was the complexities of it. Or it, you know, you had the VL1 and you had the Prophecy of the Z1 Moss board in the in the Triton, and then that's kind of it, really, isn't it? I, I guess the software versions of it now, but it never really became the mainstream. No, I, I uh, to me, so there's a a a plugin that came comes with Logic or came with Logic. I haven't updated my logic in years, but uh, it's called, um, oh, wow. So that's how long it's been since I used it. There's a physical modeling plugin in logic that I think takes the idea of, um, I'm going to try and load it up and refresh my my failing memory here uh, as we're talking, uh, that, that takes physical modeling to the most musical, um, just the most, Amazing, imagine. Oh, sculpture, duh. It's called sculpture in Logic. Um, you, you'd have to have just the most genius imagination to try to come up with the sounds uh, that you can get from sculpture um, or, or by a more complex uh, physical modeling model than prophecy uh, to, get the, to, to get the kind of sounds you can get out, out of sculpture. Um, it's a very promising technology. A uh, very promising approach for sound design, but it's just not that intuitive. Yeah. yeah, and and of course, in the meantime, sort of from the late '90s into the 2000s, there was the return to analog. Really, we talked about it on the show last week. I did with about synth evolution with Ollie um, Freak, where we had the reintroduction of virtual analog, and the whole analog trend came back again. So it kind mm. of. I guess in your career, you started working on analogs, went through the digital, and then you're going back the other way now, back to digital, either being virtual analog um, or working on actual analog again. Yeah. The, it, it was a surprise to me uh, once I started getting into your rack. Um, uh, so let's see, I started putting that thing together like maybe five or six years ago. Um, I have w- way too much stuff. But uh, even five or six years ago, I was surprised at how many synth- how many companies that were making making those things. Um, and but but it's it is such a joy. I, I I don't have any real high end stuff in there, and you know I've got a lot of dope for stuff, and um, I have a, I have a braids oscillator, you know. Not the most expensive stuff, but uh, it's a joy to be able to build a system that complex and not have it completely <laughs> break the bank and have all the flexibility like, you know, like you'd want to have from a master, massive Emerson sized rig. Um, I think that in general, the, when when we were programming sounds 
analog sounds for Korg since early on, there was a certain aesthetic. You know, there was a certain line between what makes a good studio quality sound and what kind of sound is just junky or crap or amateur or, you know, just bad programming. One of the things that has changed in the last 10, 15 years is what constitutes a good analog synthesis sound. And um, like one of, one of the great things about the Mini Moog was that it had, you know, if you wanted to, you could use three oscillators and get this fat animated sound. That was, that was the money sound back, back in the day. Now a single oscillator, you know, producing like a really thin pulse wave sound can be used really effectively musically. So, so the, the nature of what constitutes good synthesis and, and enjoyable or intriguing to listen to sounds has changed. And um, I think that modular synthesis uh, affords, affords that kind of um, sound, sound design more immediately than if you have a, uh, a synth that has, you know, all these bells and whistles and, and there's a temptation to want to use them all. Yeah. But yeah, the, it's uh, and and uh, the the other thing about virtual analog is that coming from a, an analog, a real analog background, um, it, it's kind of easy to hear the difference between like the good emulations and the ones that are just okay. The ones that are just okay, they they kind of sound a little bit dull, like this. There's just a certain certain sizzle that's missing, and when that sizzle is there that is always a sign of you know of good programming and and real uh, authentic uh, authenticity in the detail it's that magical top end hash that you almost can't even really hear that that can make the difference between a, a synth emulation sounding like okay or okay i, I don't need to spend like nine thousand dollars on the real thing from you know tone tweakers anymore i can buy this 129 twenty nine dollar plugin because it sounds like it's supposed to yeah yeah and th then you've you've worked on the recent uh korg since like the wave state the mob wave and the 2600 plugin as well which i think is 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 one of the nicest sounding um plugins and the most fun I've had with plugins for some time because it's so physical you know you drag you can drag all the cables and everything but it absolutely sounds brilliant but there's some nice sounds on there and I recognized your name on some of the presets on there as well yeah um and, and well that dovetails perfectly into what I said about like getting the top end fidelity right um I love the ARP I I fell in love with it from like the moment I played it, you know, they sent me, they sent me a beta version of the plugin. And of course, the first thing I'm going to do is open the filter and, and just have one oscillator and take a listen to it to see if I heard that buzz. And I did. And, um, so I made, I don't know, I think I made like 30, the odd number of 34 factory sounds for the, for the, uh, initial release of the ARP 2600. And then I made a patch library of over 200 sounds that is being distributed by Plugin Guru. Um, the fact that I would sit on my own and make 200 factory, you know, 200 sounds, that, that's indication of how much I love <laughs> the, the synth. And, and on my system, because I'm running a slightly older system, I can only play four notes at a time. Uh, you know, if I try to play five notes on the art plugin, my system craps out. It can't handle it. But having the ability to only play four notes and hear that fidelity, and uh, it's got so so many bells and whistles that I was really able to let my imagination kind of run wild. Like, oh, what if I patch this into this? What's it going to do? And it did it. Okay, let me improve on that by doing this and this and this. Um, so that that just says a lot about. Um, how good that synth is and and how flexible it is you know i did 200 sounds i think there are i don't know 40 drum just drum sounds alone and it, it uh, i'm usually reluctant to make drum sounds on an analog synth but it it held up to the task so yeah, yeah. that's uh that that that's a big winner in my book yeah it's really nice i really i really enjoy playing with that and i i created some patches because it's so easy because mm. you can just start oh, okay let's try this we'll put it there and yeah, and I think 
um, yeah, it's just a fun synth to play. And I've never played a twenty six, a real twenty six hundred, but I've seen the comments of people saying it does sound like like a twenty six hundred. Yeah, yeah, uh, it 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 just does. Yeah, it just does. And and that sort of leads me then on to um, the latest project you're working on. Korg just announced the Multipoly. I've got my pre order in. Um, I'm okay. hoping it'll arrive this week. Might might but Friday maybe. Um, but yeah, so so you worked on the sound design. So your, some of your presets are in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and that um, what that seems to have a it, it a, a lot of questions about you know is it like a mod wave is it like a wave state but to me from look just from what I've read it looks like something entirely different on its own because it's got a lot of things that the others the other synths don't have. Yeah. Um. I've noticed that since the mod wave came out, uh, that on online there is a lot of discussion, conversation, questions being raised about, well, which one, which one should I get, the mod wave or the wave state? You know, there's a, a lot of either or commentary. And I think the underlying premise is that, well, somehow they're both the same. I mean, they sort of look the same. Somehow they're both the same. So maybe I should get one over the other or how does one compare? So, and and this is only, you know, this this sort of either or thinking has expanded now to to the multi-poly. I see, you know, comments like, you know, should should I get a, a multi-poly? You know, I, some guy recently said, I just ordered a, a, a mod wave, but... Should I maybe get a multi poly instead? Um, so I, I guess a, a couple of things. The the guys at Korg R and D aren't in the habit of repeating themselves. You know, if they're going to come out with a new synth, it's it's going to be because there's something new, you know, novel about it. So the 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 wave state is obviously um, it, it's got it's 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 got roots going back to the wave station but it it does a whole lot more and nothing like it's been introduced since you know the 90s so it's wave sequencing 2.0 it, it it takes wave sequencing to the next level you have a lot more options the mod wave so that's wave sequencing the mod wave is uh wave table synthesis and you know as as we were saying before it's like comparing a ppg to the to the wave station one's going to sweep through static waveforms and the other one is going to sweep through samples so you're not going to get the same they're they're two different animals short short story two different animals and then you've got the uh the multi-poly which has roots in the monopoly which is a four oscillator synth where you could actually play the same note repeatedly and it would it would cycle through the different oscillators but on the multi-poly it'll cycle through four different uh, uh, patches so and it's got filters and it does have some uh, it has a really good filter types not all of which are duplicated from the previous sense so really the 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 lesson here is that you know while some of the specs may look the same on paper and they're all analog style synths they're going to have a sound source they're going to have filters and amplifiers and envelope generators and lfos and sequencers it's all boilerplate stuff, but it all comes down to the basic sound generation um, model. You know, wave sequencing is one thing. It's different from uh, wave table synthesis. And then the monopoly, uh, the multipoly is more of a traditional analog synthesizer with some, uh, with this layer rotate thing, which is a really neat way to approach synthesis, having every note play a slightly different sound or completely different sound. In that way, it's sort of like wave sequencing, but with analog synthesizers. You know, you can mm. bounce around between these four different sounds. But they're three completely different uh, synths. So, you know, if if you like what one does, if the factory programs give give you the uh, a, a good impression of what the synth does, and you think it's those are different enough from what the mod wave does or the wave uh, wave state does. If you ha if you can afford it, add that to your synth arsenal. It's not it's not like well I need one over the other. 
uh, and as I replied in one of those posts, it's like, if you, if it's a matter of money, then yeah, sure. You might need to make a decision between mod wave or multi poly. But if, if you, if it's not a matter of money, if it's more a matter of creativity and you're willing to maybe stretch your credit limit a little bit, get both because they're, they're going to give you different vibes, different approaches to, to sound design. Th that's what I've done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Um, yeah, because I, I found that the mod wave. I mean, I've I've had since since you know the eighties, and I've got some that I've got deep ish into programming. But then I've got like a Karma Triton engine, so I never really got that much yeah. into sound design on that. I got a, a Mini Log, which I really did get into. Mm. But the mod wave was just something that actually really got into properly, um, and I've spent more time creating patches on that than any other synth I've ever owned. You've got like what six or seven libraries now? Oh yeah, I've probably got more. Probably yeah, even more. Probably about ten now, something oh, like wow. that. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's because it's it's so accessible. Everything it, you know, the kit since here, but all the dials are here. But you've got a great editor, and it's mm. just all the modulation routing. I think that that really drew me to it because you think, well, okay, well, I like that sound, but I want a bit of vibrato on there, but I don't want it all the time. I want it to come in later on and i only want it to come in when i've played the lower keyboard and that's where you get your mind ticking over and i think it's a bit like the 2600 you can say well i'll try that and i'll drag it's it's almost like a modern version of that and i think that's what yeah that's why and then creating sounds i, I hear a sound i think well i can i'm sure I, yeah i think the vox humana sound the the polymog you know the gary newman one so i'm mm -hmm. sure i could do that on the mob wave and yeah you can you just have to try and get your head around how it was how it was done, and then you can kind of deconstruct it and reconstruct it on the mob wave. And I, have, I found really there aren't any sounds, synth sounds that I haven't been able to to recreate. So I've been listening, you know, mm. listening to Tangerine Dream and think, oh, I like that sound. I'm sure I could do that. And but whereas the the wave state is something totally different. That they're not. You can recreate the same sounds on both of them, but they do totally different things and the sequence and everything else. So yeah, I'm looking forward to getting the molly, the the multi. Polly to 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 again to have that as a blank canvas to go right what what can I do with this I'm, and I think that's what's really exciting about it. Yeah, it's it's a and it it sounds great. It's very flexible. Um, it's it's a simpler in in many ways it's a simpler synth to operate than the the mod wave. You know, you don't have as many waveform choices, so it's it's not scaled down. It's just it's just it's just different. different. It doesn't have as as, as many uh, choices, which in in some cases, I, one of the things I loved about the ARP was that I was limited to doing what I could do with three oscillators and and two filters. Didn't have any of the uh, mod modulation processing uh, capabilities of the wave state and the mod wave, etc. Like the the uh, the gates or the the you know uh, the the curve adjustments. There was n none none of that stuff, and I, I learned to really appreciate having sort of a limited range of controls to produce sound uh, with the ARP as opposed to it, you know, being a total kid in a candy store with, with the mod wave where I could modulate anything with anything. And if I didn't really like that sawtooth wave, I could pick a different one because, you know, there are a million different variations of sawtooth amongst all the different wavetables and I could modify it with morph and, you know, so yeah yeah I, I i'm looking forward to uh to, to trying it out and uh yeah i've got the space cleared here ready so <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah i am I'm looking forward to it but um and, and my advice to anybody who would get these synths is really spend time with it as well the, the mod wave particularly and the wave state of, of rewards the time that you spend on them mm. uh, rather than just playing with the presets and then moving on to the next piece of gear I think you get, you know, you get a synth and really spend time with it. And you can really get a lot out of it. And uh, I, I've created all these sounds now, uh, probably a thousand on my mob wave now. And uh, so when I come to do a track, I've got pretty much something already. And uh, the sound yeah. creation inspires tracks as well. So it's, it's been, it's been great. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it's been absolutely brilliant talking. I was really glad you could uh, you could do this. Uh, I knew I was going to enjoy chatting to you on this one. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you uh, uh, joining me for this week's show.
It's my pleasure, and uh, thank thank you again for inviting me. And uh, I'll include link to the twenty six hundred uh, set um, on the show notes and description of the video as well. So anybody who wants to check that out. Well, it was it was brilliant talking to you, and it's and it's um, yeah. I would if I'd if I'd said to myself in the you know when I first played the ski jam on the way state that I'd be chatting with the guy that created it. I've th- <laughs> been very impressed with that. Uh, so really do appreciate you joining us and maybe uh, I'll get you back on the show when I've spent some time on the multi-poly to, uh, to, to get some tips from you. Yeah. Once, uh, cause, cause I have to, I have to get one myself. Um, but once, once I get one, um, I, I had, I had a prototype, but it had to go back. Um, you know, and there's an on-screen editor and everything we can, you know, we can talk multi-poly programming and I do the screen sharing thing and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's, we'll, let's do, we'll do that. Right. Well, uh, it was really great to talk to you, Peter, and uh, we'll, I'll speak to you again soon. All right. Thanks to Peter. We'll be back uh, same time, same place next week. Something totally different, probably, but we'll see you then.